Welcome to the Solar Decathlon Building Science Education Series. I'm Paul Tursolini, and in this episode, I'll be continuing our demonstration of calculating R values for a wall. Please note that this is part two of this demonstration. In part one, we walked through an example of calculating R for a homogeneous concrete wall. I would recommend starting there since this episode uses an example that is a bit more complicated. In the concrete wall from our previous example, the materials and the thickness of each layer of the wall were the same along all the wall. So the thermal resistance of the wall is consistent for all pathways of heat transfer. However, not all walls are constructed this way. Walls are sometimes made up of multiple components within the same layer. Therefore, the thermal resistance of the wall differs depending on which pathway of heat transfer you look at. If we take a stud framed wall as our new example and look at it from the top, we can see that it's not consistent for each layer. I'll get more into more detail on these layers in a moment, but for now I want to talk a little bit about wooden studs. Studs are used to create the structural frame of many residential buildings, which you may recognize in this photo shown here. For our schematic diagrams, I'm going to represent the studs as a box with lines from the corners like this. Here are some more example photos showing a stud framed house under construction. You can see how they are used as structural members to support the walls, windows, and ceiling. And these studs are available in a variety of dimensions. A typical stud is one that is called a two by four to represent something that is two inches by four inches in cross section. Until World War I, lumber had these actual dimensions, but this started to change. And since 1964, two by four lumber has been standardized as one and a half inches by three and a half inches. Likewise, a two by six is actually one and a half inches wide by five and a half inches deep. Once you get to a two by eight, the pattern changes a bit and the actual dimensions are one and a half inches by seven and a quarter inches. This new pattern continues for two by tens and two by twelves as shown here. The difference between the conventional names for the sizes of studs and their actual dimensions is important for calculating the R value of the wall because these measurements will be inputs for calculations later in this episode. Now, back to our schematic diagram. Walls in residential buildings are typically constructed by framing a building with studs. The most common spacing for studs is 16 inches on center. Sheathing is the covering on the outside of the wall, which is sometimes made of plywood with siding or some other exterior finish added outside that. On the interior, drywall is often used. Between these layers and between the studs, there's a cavity in the wall that can be filled with insulation. We will cover more detail on the various types of insulation in a different episode, but for now, just know that insulation is used to help reduce the amount of heat transfer through the building envelope. Before 1970, these cavities were often empty. As people became more interested in energy efficiency, walls were ideal spaces to add insulation. And as more insulation was desired, exterior walls shifted from two by four to two by six construction to add thickness to the wall cavity and allow for more insulation. In either case, there are different flow pathways of heat heat through the studs and heat through the insulation. These heat flow rates are additive. So the Q dot equals Q dot for the stud pathway plus Q dot for the insulation pathway. Substituting our Fourier's law equation for each term, we see that there are unique values for U and A for the heat transfer through the stud and through the insulation. Note that each term has the same delta T. So we can cancel them out from the equation because the temperature difference from the inside to the outside is the same for each term. Solving for U total, we get U times A for the stud plus U times A for the insulation over the total area of the wall. 
which is the area of the studs plus the area of the insulation. Simplifying this further, we can show this as U stud times A stud divided by A total plus U insulation times A insulation divided by A total. The ratio of A stud to A total is called the framing factor, or how much frame there is, compared to the total area of the insulated wall. The remainder can be insulation. It's not uncommon for the framing factor to be 15%. If a wall is constructed with 2x4 or 2x6 studs spaced at 16 inches on center, by far the most common distance, the wall would be comprised of 1.5 inches of stud with 14.5 inches of insulation in between. If we assume the height of the wall is the same across its entire length, the area is width times height, and therefore the height also cancels out to give us a similar equation. But the area terms have been simplified, so we now have only the width of the studs and the insulation of the wall. For this example, the framing factor is 1.5 divided by 16, or 9.4%. Windows and doors require extra framing, as well as a top stud, or a top plate, and a bottom stud, or a bottom plate. So the actual framing factor would be a little different, but overall 15% is a good number to start with for an assumed framing factor without measuring the area of every stud. Now let's calculate the R value of this wall. We will assume our wall is built with 2x4 studs spaced at 16 inch centers. For this example, we will consider no top or bottom plates and no windows or doors. So we will not assume the 15% framing factor as part of the example. Looking at the picture, we have two pathways for heat to flow, through the studs and through the insulation. The entire wall is covered with half-inch drywall on the inside and half-inch plywood on the exterior. Typically, we would also have siding on the outside, but for simplicity of this example, we will only have plywood sheathing on the exterior. Looking at the layers from the inside to outside, usually it is easiest to create a table such as this one. Path 1 is through the studs and path 2 is through the insulation. For path 1, starting with the interior film coefficient, just like the previous episode, we have R equals 0.68. Next is the drywall, which has an R value of 1.10 per inch. So half inch drywall is 0.55. The 2x4 stud is 3.5 inches in the direction of the heat transfer, so at 0.94 per inch, the R value is 3.29. The half inch plywood has an R value of 1.56 per inch, resulting in an R value of 0.78. And finally, the exterior film coefficient is 0.17. Adding these R values in the path yields a total R value for path 1 of 5.47. Path two is similar, except instead of the stud, we have three and a half inches of fiberglass insulation, which has an R value of 3.14 per inch. This gives an R value of 10.99 for the fiberglass. The total R value through path two then is 13.17. Going back to our equation from earlier, the U factors for path one through the studs and path two through the insulation are calculated as the inverse of R. And the widths of the studs are one and a half inches with the remaining insulation cavity at 14 and a half inches. Solving this equation for U total, the total U factor for our wall is 0.086. Or if we want to express it as R, we would take one over U to get the R value of 11.63. Note how much better the R value of the insulation is compared to the studs. The lower R value of the studs decreases the overall R value of the wall. You may be noticing that this calculation lends itself to using a spreadsheet to find R values and to calculate heat transfer through different types of wall assemblies. We'll highlight this in another episode to demonstrate another example calculation using this approach.
That's all for this episode. I hope this helps you understand how our values are calculated for wall sections. Thank you for watching, and as always, let us know if you have any questions.